Tonight on The Daily Debrief, this mother abused her daughter, a boyfriend on trial for a murderous revenge with a twisted fetish. He asked Gypsy to clean up the blood naked because that turned him on. And that led to sex? Plus, an accused Mexican drug lord faces an American jury. Also, a car doesn't budge at a stop sign and one man is dead. That's straight ahead on The Daily Debrief for Tuesday, November 13th. And good evening, everybody. Welcome to The Daily Debrief. Opening statements today in the biggest U.S. federal prosecution to date of an accused drug lord. Joaquin Guzman, better known as El Chapo, is on trial on a series of charges in U.S. District Court in Brooklyn. He's accused of smuggling nearly a half million pounds of cocaine into the United States. Chief investigative correspondent Brian Ross is literally just back from federal court seconds ago. He joins us with an update on the debrief. Well, Aaron, the day started slowly because two more jurors acted to get off the jury, apparently afraid of what would happen if they found him guilty. And it took all day to select two more alternates to have a full panel of 12 jurors and six alternates. And then a bombshell on the opening statements that came from El, El Chapo's lawyer, Frederick Lichtman. He is essentially putting the U.S. government on trial. He said officials at the highest levels of the U.S. and Mexican government conspired. There's an uglier side to the story, one they don't want you to hear. He talked about crooked DEA agents, and you said their testimony will reveal the lies they told, and that the witnesses will be some of the gutter snipes, some of the lowest people who will make your skin crawl. That was El Chapo's opening blast. Wow, that, that is a blast. It, it is a harsh opening statement. And, and look, sometimes defense attorneys do this. They huff and puff, and then at the end, we're, we're looking and exactly. saying the house is still standing. <laughs> But this will be really interesting to watch and see how this plays out. Especially if he's going to start talking about crooked DEA agents. After all, Lickman is the lawyer who got John Gotti Jr. off in a trial in Brooklyn as well. He knows what he's doing in these cases. He said the notion that he's a mythical legend is just false and that the Mexican government has made El Chapo a scapegoat for their own corruption. Interesting theory. What did the U.S. prosecutors say? Well, they had a rather matter-of-fact presentation, said this is a trial about murder, violence, bribery, and drugs, talking about the hundreds and hundreds of tons of drugs that El Chapo allegedly brought into the country, cocaine, marijuana, starting as a small-time man who figured out how to use tunnels, trains, planes, semi-trucks, and submarines even to bring the cocaine and marijuana from Mexico into the U.S. It'll be an incredibly interesting case to watch. I wish we could televise it. We can't. Cameras aren't allowed in federal no courts. Uh, what was the mood in the courtroom? I mean, it's one thing to repeat the facts of what these people said, but it, is it electrifying? Is it charged? Is it tense? How would you describe it? It seemed rather matter-of-fact. Al Chapo came in dressed in a dark suit with a dark tie. His wife had come and brought, we saw her with a garment bag, so we assumed she brought him. And then when he came into the court, he was not in shackles, and he waved briefly to his wife, and she waved back. Interesting insight. Brian Ross, I know you're going to be in court for much of this trial, but it is expected to last several months, so uh, I wish you could be there for every second. Right. Three to four months, they told the jury, uh, with two weeks off around Christmas. But this is one that will take on you know, huge proportions, especially if El Chapo's defense team can make good on their promise to show U.S. corruption at the highest levels involving what he called crooked DEA agents. Chief investigative correspondent Brian Ross, I'll let you catch your breath. You just ran back That's in right. in the nick of time. I really appreciate the update. You bet. Let's move to Missouri where opening statements also occurred in the case of a man accused of traveling into town, murdering his online girlfriend's mother, and then fleeing the state. Nicholas Godijohn is facing first-degree murder charges related to the death of Claudine Blanchard. She went by the nickname Dee Dee and she died in 2015 at age 48. The victim's daughter, Gypsy Blanchard, was dating the defendant. She was in on it and pleaded guilty to second-degree murder. She's serving a 10-year sentence. Prosecutors went soft on her because her mother had abused her. The prosecution began its opening statement by taking jurors through the decision they say the defendant made to kill the victim. Side of Claudine Blanchard's bedroom door stood the defendant dressed in all black, wearing blue latex gloves, holding a knife. For the defendant, he was in love with Gypsy Blanchard, Claudine's daughter. 
And as he stood there, the only thing that stood between him being with Gypsy was Claudine. And so he stood there holding that knife for a minute, considering and deliberating the murder of Claudine Blanchard. But this was not the first time the defendant deliberated. Before he got to the house and walked in the front door, he was handed the blue gloves and the knife. And he deliberated. In his words, he had two thoughts, a benevolent thought that he described as an angel on one shoulder that said, just take Gypsy and run, and a malevolent thought, a devil on the other shoulder that said, the bitch is dead. Even that wasn't the first time the defendant deliberated. Hours before getting to the house, he sat in his hotel room at the day's end, texting Gypsy, making sure everything was ready. To secure a first-degree murder conviction, the prosecutor must convince jurors that the killing was both intentional and deliberate. Those are requirements under Missouri law, and that is why the prosecutor spent so much time explaining this act of deliberation. 36 hours prior, he got on a Greyhound bus in Milwaukee, knowing he was coming to Springfield to murder Claudine. That bus stopped in three different cities as the defendant sat on it, knowing he was coming to Springfield to murder Claudine. That wasn't the first time the defendant deliberated. It was a year prior when the defendant, while speaking with his girlfriend, Gypsy, was first introduced to the idea of killing Claudine Blanchard a year prior. And the evidence will show that although it was Gypsy's idea, it was the defendant's deliberation that led to him standing outside of Claudine's bedroom door with gloves on, dressed in black, holding a knife, and thinking the bitch is dead. And the evidence will show that after that deliberation on June 10th of 2015, he entered that bedroom and stabbed Claudine Blanchard to death. There, the prosecutor told jurors how the state believes the murder occurred and gave chilling details of what happened just after. He goes inside. She's sleeping on her stomach. He straddles her, and he begins to stab her multiple times in the back, and he cuts the back of her neck. He describes stabbing her approximately four times. The evidence will show it ends up being more, but he describes four, and that he can tell some are going deeper than others because the knife is getting harder to pull back. He can tell that he punctures a lung, and that matches the autopsy that ultimately reveals that Claudine didn't have four, she had 17 stab wounds to her back, to the back of her neck, and she had deep cuts to her neck that went all the way to the vertebrae of her neck. The defendant describes her screaming and some statements that he made to her as he's murdering her. Then he talks about afterwards the fact that he went and got Gypsy from the bathroom and that they began to clean up. He adds that he asked Gypsy to clean up the blood naked because that turned him on. And that after cleaning up, as Claudine's dead knife-ridden body is laying in her bedroom, the defendant and Gypsy actually go into Gypsy's room and have sex. They then ultimately pack up, take a taxi to the Days Inn, a Greyhound to Wisconsin, and that's ultimately where they're found. Before they get on that Greyhound bus, they take the knife and they take those blue latex gloves and they actually go to the post office, put them in an envelope, and mail them to the defendant's residence in Wisconsin so they don't get caught on the bus with it. 
Pastor John's defense attorney pointed to the victim's mental health issues. Remember, Dee Dee Blanchard kept subjecting her daughter Gypsy to unnecessary medical treatments. The defense says that those treatments caused Gypsy to snap, dragging Nick into that murderous plot. Gypsy was heartbroken. She wanted her mom to accept Nick, and her mom described Nick as creepy. Gypsy knew there was only one way she was going to be able to spend a life with Nick. There was only one way to get out from under the grasp of her mother, and that was to kill her mother. Gypsy formulated this plan, and she wavered on it for a while she was committed to it. Later she decided, no, that's not the right thing. Nick was happy to do whatever Gypsy wanted. He was always compliant. And finally, Gypsy said, it's getting worse here. This has to be done. She stole some more money from her mother, provided that to Nick to come down on a bus and stay in a hotel. She stole a knife from Walmart so that Nick could use that as the murder weapon and provided Nick with gloves and tape and everything he would need to go through with her plan. Recall that Nick Godijan has been diagnosed with autism himself. The defense is likely to argue that he believed murder was the only escape from the abuse of Gypsy's mother. Nick arrived there at the house. Knife was ready, gloves were ready, tape was ready. He entered that home and saw Gypsy standing there. A girl who could walk, not someone captive in a wheelchair. Looking around the living room, there were wheelchairs. The devices that bound her. And Nick went through with Gypsy's plan. Once they got to Wisconsin, uh, Gypsy put a Facebook post uh, on a shared account, an account she shared with her mother that said, the bitch is dead, etc., etc. The goal there, and Gypsy will tell you this, was that she wanted her mother's body to be found. She wanted her mother to have a proper burial. And Gypsy will also tell you that she never thought she would be caught, that people would just forget about her, that they would bury her mom, and the world would move on. Before she left the house, she stole approximately $5,000 from her mom that her mom kept in the house in cash. Her goal was to start a new life with that. Her and Nick would live off that money for a while. And they'd start a family together. Defense attorney Ross Kramer is with us tonight on The Daily Debrief. Ross, good to see you again. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Okay, this is a common defense tactic. Blame the co-conspirator. You know, I don't think that they're necessarily blaming the co-conspirator here. I think it's a confluence of circumstances that make this case sympathetic. It's her situation with her mother. It's, it's a, a terribly unsympathetic victim in the case who was killed. I think putting this backstory out there and filling in the blanks humanizes him, humanizes the co-defendant, I don't think it's placing blame on someone as much as it is trying to give a full picture. Well, look, the defense attorney said, okay, this was all her, it was not him. She came up with a plan. He just acted on it. And we're expecting the twist of the autism to come into it is because of his autism, the defendant's autism, that he was more likely to go along with it. Whereas you or I might turn around and say, wait a minute, this is a crazy plan. Yeah, no, and I think that a really fascinating piece of evidence uh, was before the jury today, which was the confession video. And it was, you know, an hour and a half long. And his behavior, the defendant's behavior on that video was bizarre. His, his tone, his demeanor, he talked about going out the day after the murder for breakfast and what he ordered with exactly the same tone in his voice as he described the actual stabbing. We were talking in the other room earlier about just how much detail he gave. He wasn't afraid to tell that interrogator everything that happened. Yeah, I mean, this was, this was a very bizarre setting. Um, he walked in there without any sort of real defense. Usually when people talk to law enforcement, they talk with the expectation they're going to be able to talk their way out of it. Exactly. He didn't walk in there with any uh, notion that he was going to give any excuses. He just walked in and with a straight face gave a, 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 a timeline of exactly what happened 
and in apparently a very honest, convincing way, which included him talking about his multiple personalities and, and basically everything else that had happened. It was an incredible confession. We're going to talk about that in a bit, and we will check in with you again in a moment, Ross. Thanks. Still ahead tonight on the Daily Debrief, though, we are not done, as I said, with the Nicholas Godejohn murder trial. A look at that defendant's chilling confession and what he said drove him to murder. That's after the break, here on the Daily Debrief. Welcome back, everybody. We're back in the Nicholas Godejohn case. One of the early prosecution witnesses was a cab driver who testified about picking up the defendant from a Springfield, Missouri area days in. I'm very talkative, you know, with my passengers a lot of times, um, especially people that I pick up at the airport or pick up at a hotel room. You know, normally I say, you know, what brings you to Spring Patch, you know, you know, Springfield. And um, this gentleman, you know, hey, I'm from Wisconsin. You know, he said he was here to meet his girlfriend. Um, you know, that's pretty much, you know, just small talk. And then as you were approaching the address at 2103 West Volunteer Way, do you remember him uh, saying anything else or, or doing anything else? When I got there, he asked me to, to wait just a few seconds. He was on his cell phone. Uh, he was texting his he said he was texting his girlfriend to, to see where he was supposed to, what door he was supposed to go to. It says something like that. And if it's 157, fair to say it's pretty dark out? Correct. Okay. What I saw is he got out of the cab and he went to the right of the home, right rear, rear to, of the home. After a few other witnesses, prosecutors played the defendant's confession. He said the murder was Gypsy's idea, but that he would do anything for her. It's not fair to Gypsy for her to be honest and you to, to, you to lie, okay? So what I want to know is, is um, can you tell me this first? Did Gypsy know that you were going to kill her mother? Um, honestly, she asked me to. Okay. So, so Gypsy knew you were going to do it because Gypsy asked you to. Yes. Why did she ask you to do that? Because she felt it was her only way to be with me. Okay. She felt like if, if you killed the mom, then that's the only way she could be with you. Yeah. Do you know the mom's name? I don't know her real name. All I know is that she goes by Dee Dee. Dee Dee. Okay. So, um, has, has Gypsy asked you to kill anyone else? No. Okay, she just wants you to kill her mom. Yes. Okay. And how did Gypsy ask you to do that? Did she ask you to do that in a text message, on a Facebook, or in person, or something different? Well, it was more than once. I mean, you had a uh, uh, Facebook, um, we, we would talk about it on there, we would talk about it even on Texas. Okay. The truth is, okay, I'll admit it. I did actually. Stay up for me. I will make it. Okay. I, the only reason I did it is because I did it for me and her. That's the real reason I did it. I would have never did it if it was not for me and her. Okay. So you wouldn't have done it if somebody else would have asked? No. Okay. There's no way I would have did it for anyone else. Okay. So you just. I truly do worship her to the point that that's what I want to do for her. Okay. Okay. Well, I think you've proved that, right? Yes. I think that you've proved that, that you, you do what she asked you to do. Okay, folks, let's step away from the Godijan case for a moment to move to Florida, where defendant Armando Baptista faces manslaughter charges in what's been described as a road rage stabbing. Victim Fakhar Dean Knight went by the nickname Mohammed. He was on his way home from a party with his girlfriend, Wendy Gambolis, when he lost his life. Defendants Armando Baptista and Demetrius Elder were stopped at a stop sign. When Knight pulled up and, the, and would not move, Knight honked his, har, his horn, but still nothing happened. What happened next is a big he said, she said, but it resulted in Knight being stabbed and killed. The elder of a lesser charge in a separate trial. As to Baptista, the prosecution's case is winding down. Today, a friend testified about a party where the victim and the defendants were present before the stabbing. Some people say there was trouble brewing at that party, but the friend disagreed. Here is cross-examination and redirect. You didn't see two people fighting in the street, correct? If I did, I would have broke it up, sir. It would have never, a mom would have been right here. We won't be in this courtroom today if I would have seen anything. 
Did you ever see, you never, the, the, did you see the front vehicle? Did you see the Impala at all? The Impala was, no, is the answer? I'm, I seen a dark car. I think I did, matter of fact, I did see a car riding off. I think I did see the car that they was in. You, Batista and um, Elder. I'm focused on Muhammad, but at the same time, I see a car speeding off. It's like Miramar Parkway. Mm -hmm. You have to be there to understand what I'm talking about. It's hard to explain. When the police come to talk to you that night, did you cooperate with them? I don't remember. You don't remember if you cooperated with them? I don't remember. I just know they was asking me a whole bunch of questions. They kept asking me like the same questions, and I was trying to. I was just upset that what happened. I lost a friend. He died for no reason. Redirect, Mr. McNabb. You stated on cross examination that they settled their problem. What individuals had a problem? Like what? Were you talking about Walter? Oh, and yes. From my knowledge, Walter and um, Armando Baptiste settled a differences. Back to attorney Ross Kramer, who's with us in studio tonight. Let's talk about this Baptiste case. You said that witness had a lot of attitude. Yeah, I mean, I like the way he was testifying. Juries uh, sense phonies, and they really sniff out phonies. I thought he was testifying as an honest guy, letting his own personality shine through. And I think the things he said and the way he said them gave him a lot of credibility. He was a little bit dicey about whether he was really cooperating with police or not. I, I thought that maybe some jurors could uh, assume something negative from that. But, but your assessment is probably accurate as well. I give you credit for that. Let's talk about that Godijan confession, though. He said in there that he worshipped his girlfriend and would do anything for her. And the interrogator said, I think you proved that. You stabbed your girlfriend's mother to death. Yeah, I mean, the way he said it, I think, is as important as what he said. He went on and talked about this for an hour and a half. His facial expressions, his tone never changed. It was business as usual. He was telling her a narrative as if he was just talking about another day at the office. It was, it was completely bizarre. And I think the defense, who may not have had much in this case, may be able to make something. If I was there... I would have an expert in there. I would have a psychologist looking at that video and testifying that this was not somebody who was in a normal state of mind at the time he did it or at the time he confessed. Ross Kramer, really appreciate your insight tonight on The Debrief. Thanks. Okay, that's all the time we have for today. A reminder that the Law and Crime Network will be streaming the Armando Baptista case and the Nick Godijan case live beginning tomorrow at 9 a.m. Have a good evening from all of us.